Thanks, everybody. You know, I've been working with Synopsys for so long now. As, as Phil mentioned back in the day, I was in the physical design group. We had a different name for it then, but the physical design group. And we worked very closely at that time on a lot of the initiatives that, um, that have continued to this day and I'll talk more about. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to represent the work we've done together because as we'll talk about, it's only through collaboration and working together that we can enable the kind of success, the kind of um, rapid results uh, that you need. You're all here because you're intelligent, uh, capable designers and no one is suggesting you're not. But the reality is the problem we're solving is so hard, so complicated. You need good automation tools, you need good IP foundations and all that working together and that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, in my remarks, I'm going to share with you uh, four key trends that we see in the marketplace. And just to be clear, I'm not going to be the most technical speaker you, you hear from today. There's lots of much more smart people talking about details uh, later on. But I'm going to try and give you a broader landscape about what ARM sees as coming in the market. Some key trends that are going to enable opportunities for silicon uh, designers like you uh, and opportunities and complexity that we have to tackle. And as part of that, I'll give you a number of examples of how Synopsys and ARM have collaborated together, what we've done in the past, what we're doing now, what's some what's new, and where we're going in the future to really uh, enable you and support you. So I hope there's something here that is uh, exciting and interesting for you. I want to start by, I click here. I want to start by talking about this incredible uh, range of devices we're seeing and the Internet of Things. And when you have to think about the scale of this, uh, the deployment of this problem to fully appreciate it. Today, there's around 7 billion people in the world. And the installed base is somewhere around 3 billion or more smartphones uh, in the market. That's, that's huge. 2 billion personal computers, that seems like a lot. But there's already 20 billion uh, Internet of Things devices. And that is scaling rapidly to the point where we think this number is going to rapidly explode by 2035 to, uh, we think, towards a trillion devices, and whether it's 1.0 trillion or 0 0.8 trillion, the fact is it's a massive, massive number. And that's going to be a huge opportunity for us, but it also has a lot of challenges from a design perspective, from a verification perspective, software, and so on. And we're going to touch on a lot of those things today. And this is also something that's very important to ARM. You know that ARM was acquired by SoftBank about two years ago, a little less than two years ago. And one of the reasons that SoftBank saw this opportunity with ARM, besides you know, the existing business and smartphones and mobile devices and energy efficiency, is the idea that the number of connected devices is really going to explode, and there's huge opportunity for us to improve society, improve uh, efficiency, improve commerce, uh, and related to this trend. So it's something we're looking very closely at, and we're working hard on, and we'll talk about that throughout the, the presentation. The other thing about ARM that you probably know, but, but sometimes people forget, is you know, ARM is known for um, processors in mobile devices and, and smart devices. But actually, our product line has gotten broader and broader. In the, I've been in ARM 10 years now. In the 10 years I've been there, it's got, gotten so broad to being very focused on embedded devices, including extremely low uh, energy efficient uh, embedded devices that can run on a coin cell battery for years and years, all the way up to now high performance servers, high performance networking, uh, and even uh, HPC applications. So it's a broad range and that has continued to grow. So the point is we think we're the only company that really can span all the way from sensors at the very low end to servers. In fact, our mission statement talks about that. It's really to deploy ARM technology any place compute happens. And we really are trying to do that and trying to find the applications you bring to us and make sure we have uh, solutions that can suit your needs. If you look at the numbers, today uh, over 5 billion people are using ARM-based mobile phones. Pretty much it's tough to find a mobile phone that's not ARM-based these days. And so much so that mobile phones and smartphones in particular have become many people's primary compute devices. If you look at some, kinds of, uh, some regions of the world, people never touch a PC. They never touch anything that's connected by a wire to the internet. The internet is their mobile phone. It's the physical embodiment of the internet is their mobile phone. And so there's this kind of hopping across wires, there's a fancy name for it, I can never remember, but, but people actually jump right over ever getting a wired connection, they go directly to a mobile connection, and that's going to continue. People don't also know that uh, ARM's um, Mali GPU is the number one shipping GPU in the world by virtue of the fact that it's in so many different um, you know, mobile devices, Android devices. You're, if you have an Android-based TV, it probably has Mali graphics in it. People don't know that. But as I mentioned, one of the things that's exciting for me is how much our embedded product line has grown and expanded in the past 10 years. 
So much so that in 2017 alone, we shipped 8 billion embedded chips based on ARM. So annually, uh, the latest number was something like, I think it's 17 billion, if I recall that, from last year. But of that, fully 8 billion of those were in the embedded marketplace alone. And that ranges from very deeply embedded microcontrollers up to higher end embedded controllers that might be voice activated and so on. There's a broad range. To, to the point where over 125 billion uh, ARM chips have been shipped by our partners, our partner licensees, since the company was created. And that is really uh, exploding exponentially and skyrocketing. So we think there's a very broad opportunity. And I want to share with you four of these markets that we are looking at and we think are very important. And the first key trend I want to talk about today is edge compute and the implications on the network, cellular networks that we're going to see in the future. We're seeing a fundamental shift in the way compute happens. In fact, we're seeing multiple fundamental shifts. This is one of the, one of the several I'll talk about. And that is um, cloud computing. Everyone talks about cloud computing and everything moving to the cloud. And that's true. But there are some fundamental limitations to putting everything in the cloud. There's fundamental latency issues to get to the cloud that some services are better provided close to the edge of the network. There are fundamental bandwidth issues that you don't want to go all the way to the cloud to serve everything. You know, when the, new, when the latest Netflix show comes out, you don't want uh, to every household in America to go all the way to the cloud to source, to source that content. You need to have local servers in the regions to push that content locally so you get broader overall bandwidth across the network. So we're seeing a push towards taking certain kinds of compute that makes sense and pushing them towards the edge. And we see, and I'll show you in a few slides, how we think that's going to accelerate and continue in the future. There are real benefits to this as well. By having lower latency, there's new services you can provide that you couldn't provide if you have to have a longer latency. The, the fundamental bandwidth of the network is increasing, no doubt, and the, and the, the networking companies are doing incredible things to increase the, the core bandwidth. But at the end of the day, it's much better aggregate bandwidth if we can push compute farther out than if we put it all towards the center. You're seeing uh, more and more devices that are much more autonomous. You're, you're, we'll talk about cars later on. You're going to want to have cars be much more autonomous, and that's going to requ require connectivity between cars, between cars and infrastructure, as opposed to going all the way back to the server, because latency is going to be uh, uh, unable to handle that. And finally, I think there's opportunities for better monetization, better new services that we can provide as we push content towards the edge. So I think this is a really interesting opportunity. And one way to look at this is to consider the cellular networks that exist today and what's coming in the future. So today, the 4G network, let me tell you a few things about this that are, that are interesting. One thing about the 4G network is the latency for you to access to the, uh, to the network and go all the way to the cloud is not so different. So 50 milliseconds to access the network, 100 milliseconds to get to the cloud. And that kind of latency profile and that kind of configuration is okay for today's applications. It's okay for web-based services. It's okay for mobile broadband streaming applications where latency is not so critical. The other thing you notice about this, if you can see the small print at the left, is there's a relatively small number of uh, Base, uh, base station sites for 4G networks today. It's in the tens of thousands. And that's okay from a coverage perspective, but as we go forward, you're going to see that's going to evolve. Now, this 4G network and the high speed that we enjoy today has provided us some great opportunities, and it has opened up some new business cases and some new markets. The first thing is it's enabled cord cutting. So many people take their media now directly on their mobile devices. They stream their content. Even if you have a TV, you're probably streaming your content instead of having a cable provider or a satellite provider in many cases provide that content. And that's enabled by the bandwidth and enabled by this, this network, including when you're on the go. It's enabled over the top video. It's enabled the kind of mobile commerce that we've seen where so much of uh, commerce today is based on online commerce uh, uh, and, and including on mobile devices. And that's great, it's fantastic. As a matter of fact, this uh, networking and this uh, proliferation of mobile devices has created an entire generation. You know them as millennials. Millennials was a generation born between 1981 to 1996, approximately. These are ones that had technology all throughout their adult lives. And they've brought us the, the both favorable uh, e-commerce trends that probably drives many of our businesses. It also, they're also bringing lots of information consumption in new ways. They're also bringing us social media, which has pluses and minuses. 
But they're fundamentally changing, and they've been the vanguard of how a lot of these factors have changed. But as we get to the next generation of 5G, you're going to see some fundamental shifts in how this works. The first is, as 5G rolls out, and obviously 5G is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to go from 4G to 5G overnight. There's going to be a range. But as it rolls out, one of the things you're going to see is, first, the edge is going to be much, much closer than the cloud. Because we're going to put, first thing, much lower latency cells in. Much smaller cells, I'll talk about that in a moment. And we're going to get to the point where we can have much lower latency services. And that's going to bring opportunities. If you look at the latency of emerging applications, if you're trying to do certain kinds of medical control, vehicle to vehicle, to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure, things like smart cities and so on, we're going to have to have lower latency for those services to make sense. And 5G is going to enable that over time. The next thing you're going to see is the number of cells and the number of access points in the, into the network is going to be much different than in a 4G world today. You're going to see much more access points to the edge of the network, and you're going to see many more cell sites, the big cells as well as micro cells, where you're going to see an order of magnitude 10, 100, 1,000 times more small cells. That's going to be necessary to provide the latency we need and also to provide the scalability of 5G because 5G is not only going to provide lower latency, but it's going to provide overall higher bandwidth. So this kind of configuration, different than 4G, is going to provide new opportunities, and no one can really predict what these are. We know about some obvious examples, but when you bring this capability forth, smart folks like you and many others around the world will come up with new applications we haven't even thought of. In fact, there's a name for the generation after the millennials. Do you know what this is? I learned this. I didn't know this. They're called linksters. I've got an eight-year-old, eight and she has never known a world in which iPads did not exist. As a matter of fact, she was, she was born the day before the iPad launch. Uh, so uh, this generation, born after 2002, or around 2002, has been immersed in technology since they were born. And they're going to look at technology in fundamentally different ways. They're going to create fundamentally different things. Uh, and it's going to be an incredible time. I would say, uh, hold on for the ride in the years ahead. So this brings us to key trend number two. And number two is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'll use those terms largely inter interchangeably. We think machine learning is going to impact every market. In fact, it's much easier to figure out which markets it won't impact than which markets it will, because it's going to impact nearly everything. And imagine from a mobile phone, this is almost the easiest case. You want to talk to your mobile phone. You want to do voice recognition. You want it to uh, recognize your face. You want it to recognize situations. Augmented reality is a great example. There's plenty of those. Those are obvious. But there's many more examples. Obviously, uh, self-driving, autonomous driving cars is going to require extensive machine learning. But it's going to extend far beyond that. If you have home surveillance, okay, you know, you've got home surveillance cameras so that you know that no one's breaking into your house. The problem is even the most modern surveillance cameras today can say, ah, there's a person. So one, a dumb camera just records video, right? A smart camera says, ah, there's a person, and it can say this is a person uh, and they're, they're uh, walking. Okay, that's great. But the holy grail of uh, surveillance is when it says, this is a person who doesn't belong in your house. And that requires it to not only recognize people, but recognize it's not one of the residents of the house, or it's a time when you're on vacation. So taking the recognition and going to a higher level understanding, that's what people do, but today computers not so much. We have the capabilities for the first level, but the second level is still in front of us. Think about transportation. If you can improve, you know, today we have uh, maps and you know, Google Maps can tell you or Waze can tell you the best route somewhere, and it maybe it can adapt for traffic. But when you're looking at machine learning and you can plan transportation routes more holistically to save diesel, save gasoline, um, improve overall transportation logistics, the potential for cost savings is astronomical. And we all look at technology and we're thinking, how can I make the cell phone go 5% faster or whatever? But if you can save uh, transportation costs, even in a few percent, the return on that is incredible. So sometimes the most mundane applications that maybe you don't think of as exciting are incredibly lucrative and huge opportunities for us together. So ARM has been um, really innovating in this area, and you may not have heard, but in recent months we've launched a project called Project Trillium, not Trillion, Trillium. And this is a new uh, codename for suite of IP, including highly scalable processors for machine learning. And I'll talk more about that in the, in the next slide. It comprises not only a machine learning processor, which is new for us, 
It includes an object detection processor. We've actually had that before. We acquired a company a few years ago called Apical, which is one of the world leaders in object detection. Uh, and we've rolled out a new generation of that product, which is even more advanced. And then we've also rolled out some software frameworks, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Now we see uh, ML, machine learning, and AI being a huge opportunity. Today, a billion or two billion units today uh, are shipped every year annually in mobile. We see the smart IP camera space, as I talked about a minute ago, as a very fast growing market. But in fact, more broadly, AI enabled devices are expected to shift today from uh, to three billion devices annually in 2028, 10 years from now, with a 10 billion unit installed base. That's a huge opportunity for us. It's a huge opportunity to drive silicon infrastructure. It's a huge opportunity to put better smarts in these devices and add more value. So how does this Trillium thing work and how does it work together with existing uh, infrastructure and existing languages? And so this is a really cool chart and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to go in cr incredible detail, but today uh, and in the years ahead, you're gonna see applications uh, solving many different kinds of problems from images to video to speech. There are, existing, uh, there are existing frameworks today for writing and talking about machine learning from CAFE, TensorFlow, and so on like that. Those exist today, but what doesn't exist today is a way to pull those different languages and those different expressions together across a range of compute platforms. So since ARM has such a broad range of platforms from the embedded side from Cortex-M, to our higher performance Cortex-A processors, including NEON, which is acceleration for multimedia processing, uh, scalable vector extensions, SVE, our GPU products in our Mali product line, as well as the new NPU is neural processing unit that I just talked about a moment ago, as well as third-party accelerators. Some partners will do their own proprietary accelerators for custom applications, uh, and our object detection processor for object recognition. Across that entire range, We've first thing already rolled out a compute library, which is available today and has been used already by many, many thousands of designers to put uh, those uh, AI computations on top of a range of CPU and GPU solutions. But what we're rolling out with Project Trillium is in the middle, it's called ARMNN. This is a kind of middleware capability, so you can take all of these top level languages to express machine learning and artificial intelligence blend it together with the, the, uh, the compute library we provide and allow it to access this whole range. By doing this, we hope to accelerate and scale the ability to deploy machine learning applications, deploy them across a range of solutions, and you can choose. This is a little bit like if you're familiar with GPU, you've, heard, you've seen a GPU libraries that abstract away the way the GPU is implemented. It allows you to have consistent capabilities to run GPU functions, even though the GPU below may change. This is a little bit like that. It's bringing the ability to have scalable machine learning deployment across a range of platforms from ARM and from our partners. And we think only ARM can enable this because we have such a broad range of solutions today from the low end to the very high end and these new products coming now. And it's gonna span markets. Our focus for this product at first will be on the mobile phone area, smart IP cameras and uh, IDC we did some work with IDC on this to get a sense of where is ARM in this marketplace. And if you read the news, you might think that the leader in machine learning are companies that do cloud-based computing or do the training in the, in the server farms. But actually, the leader in machine learning today is ARM. Because actually, ARM-based uh, ARM systems from you know, your, the uh, smart device you have at home, your smart speaker you talk to, your mobile phone and so on are already so prevalent and inferencing is today the dominant application for mobile machine learning today. And even though we're well known for mobile phones and if you talk into your mobile phone, which I do, you talk into your dictation on your mobile phone, you do voice search, any of those things, those are already using ARM based solutions, sometimes in software, sometimes with hardware acceleration for machine learning. But if you take mobile phones off the table, remove mobile phones entirely, ARM is still the leader in machine learning from smart speakers and many other smart devices that today are recognizing and using machine learning. So what we're trying to do is broaden that range broader for more marketplaces, for, uh, increase the performance points to higher level applications, uh, and extend that scalability to a broader range. So we think machine learning is gonna be an incredibly exciting time ahead. There's opportunities for all of us as a result of that. The third key trend I wanna talk about is the internet of things and security more generally. 
Now, the Internet of Things as a concept, uh, many of you probably agree that it has been a bit overhyped as a concept. But the reality is it is happening, it is real, and devices are getting connected and this is going to continue to grow over time. The problem that I think we face, and that this is our view, is that in many cases, those devices are almost not ready. And I'll show you some examples of why that is, and I'm sure you know already. Part of the problem is making sure the devices have the performance and the low power profile, that's, that's important. But many people overlook the fact that they need to have great security and a great foundation so that they provide valuable services that are also trusted and reliable. They also need to be configurable and upgradable, and I'll talk about that um, uh, in the next slide. In fact, information security is so fundamental to these connected devices. ARM has an existing solution called Trust Zone that's in your mobile phone today, and it's one of the solutions that provides reliable e-commerce on your phone, and you can trust your banking applications and so on. And we've recently expanded that a couple of years ago with a solution called Trust Zone for Cortex-M that brings that same capability to embedded devices uh, as well. And it's so important to deploy that. You all know that in 2016, there was this incredible denial of service attack called Mirai Botnet. And the, the thing that was so amazing about this was they didn't hack laptops, they didn't hack uh, the kind of devices you'd expect them to hack. They hacked devices that you would think of as not an attack surface at all. They attacked webcams and other kinds of innocuous devices that had poor security, poor um, uh, resilience to outside attacks, and those cameras were then used and those devices were then used to, to multiply the attack. And it brought down significant portions of the internet. So we think it's fundamental that devices that are deployed, first thing, have a strong root of trust and a strong foundation of security from day one, and that those devices are then able to be updated and kept current as new threats are found. Because new threats are going to be found. So the idea that you ship a device and you can relax and never worry about that device again is crazy. We're going to have to add to these devices over time, and that both gives us a business opportunity and also a responsibility to make sure these devices can be reached. One of the things ARM has done is to put an entire new business unit called the Internet, the IoT or Internet Services Division that is talking about using uh, Embed, which is a product we made, as a foundation so that devices can be provisioned, managed, updated, uh, and scaled very easily. It's a platform for both the devices as well as in the cloud that can make that easy. Because if you're mad, imagine you're a company that makes um, a mobile, uh, an Internet of Things device. You probably have a great idea for the sensor or whatever uh, service you're going to provide, but you might not be a security expert. How do we as an industry provide a better foundation so you can focus on your innovation, but understanding that the foundation you're built on is solid, proven, tested, upgradable, and scalable. And so the two things together can be, can be a good result. If we expect to deploy Internet of Things devices by the trillions in, uh, in cost-effective ways, then we're going to have to provide this foundation that, that companies can build upon. So this actually brings us to one of the first of many examples of the great collaboration with, I'm going to come back to that, the great collaboration with Synopsys. Synopsys uh, has been investing in recent years with a number of different platforms for uh, code quality and security. One is Coverity. Coverity is a, is a static code analysis tool. In fact, we've used Coverity internally in our embed tool, in our embed product, to make sure we're, our code is we're very well tested and, and very reliable as a foundation. And Synopsys has also acquired a company called, uh, a technology called Defensix, which is more of a dynamic testing approach that looks for corner cases. So if you have a complicated protocol, how do you know you're exercising the protocol? How do you know you're not finding holes in corner cases that uh, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, exploit? We're seeing all these uh, overflow conditions and all these cases that are people are using corner cases to hack things. These kinds of technologies can make sure you're testing everything and you're looking for corner cases together. This is something that we've used to find fundamental problems. A couple years ago, there was a, there was a weakness found in, in SSL, which was a technology that had been out for a long time. But by testing it in these new ways, we were able to find vulnerabilities in SSL. And we fixed that in Embed in collaboration with Synopsys. In fact, Synopsys, this technology, Defensix, was one of the solutions that found Heartbleed, which is one of the fundamental uh, internet uh, zero-day attacks that came a few years ago. In fact, we recognize the benefit of this so much, we've deployed 
um, Coverity as integrated into our ARM DS5 solution. And DS5 is a world leading development platform that uh, ARM designers use to deploy software on ARM based uh, systems, which is what this slide is. Uh, development solutions from ARM are so important because not only do we want to get uh, companies getting the most out of their ARM based uh, solutions, but also they want to get the latest optimizations. And there are, we support, of course, open source based uh, compilers. We've done that for a long time. But many designers in the industry have been using ARM DS5 and related tools from ARM that provide uh, world class compilation, debugging, testing, and so on. And this is this great partnership I mentioned where Synopsys is also working with us with their Coverity solution. Now, the, the fourth trend, or depending how you like to think about it, and this could be trend 3B, is automotive because it's, it's probably 3B because in some sense, a car is nothing more than a really, really expensive and really, really complicated Internet of Things device. In fact, uh, one of our partners was joking that uh, we were talking about smartphones and that a, a car is basically a smartphone plus IoT on steroids on wheels. And, and that, that's actually a pretty good analogy because some of the same issues that apply to uh, f phone security, some of the same issues that apply to IoT security have to apply to cars. And let me show you two examples. These are actually not randomly chosen cars. The one on the left was a Jeep. And you may recall that a few years back, a couple of um, industry researchers, white hat hackers, were able to take over a Jeep driving down the highway. And if you don't recall, they took over the Jeep by hacking into the radio, not into the drivetrain, not into the, they hacked into the radio. And from the radio, they got into the drivetrain. They could change the steering, they could change the braking, and they could take over the car. And that doesn't scare, you, scare the hell out of you, it should. But what's worse than that was that the way Jeep had to fix that was to recall those cars and bring them back to the factory. Now contrast this with example number two. Tesla, uh, more recently, um, slightly later, had a weakness that also was shown where researchers could literally with a laptop take over control of a, a Tesla car. And Tesla had released a patch to that problem before the video was made public. No car recall, over the air update to fix the, fix the vulnerability. Now that's, that shows you the difference between two things. One is understanding you need to build in security as a foundation. Uh, and two, the ability to update and fix problems because it's not a question of if your car is gonna get hacked, but when. And in case you didn't, you think those are isolated examples, just yesterday in the news, uh, that BMW, the researchers found an, a wide range of fundamental weaknesses in BMW cars as well. I'm a big BMW fan. Uh, a number of fundamental flaws in BMW cars and they're working to fix those now. So it's not a question of if but when. And so how can we design these platforms so that they're upgradable, secure from the beginning, but also upgradable when we find, um, find inevitable problems. And the opportunity in automotive is massive. Of course, we, we always hear about uh, autonomous driving, and that's going to be important for sure. But actually, the, it's much more complicated because what you're seeing is subsystems all across the car are getting smarter. They're getting more and more integrated. And if you think about the Jeep example, it's not enough to just secure the perimeter of the car. The old way to do security was you build a big wall with big high, high moat, uh, moat and big high walls around something, and that's good enough. The problem is if you get in through the weakest part, then you're inside and you can run amok. So not only are we having to secure the major systems, we have to secure the minor systems and make sure everything is working in a secure way from the very beginning. That's made more complicated by the fact that autonomous driving is going to require drive-by-wire and it's going to require more uh, uh, controllability by uh, by the machine learning, by the autonomous driving. It's going to be extended by the fact that we have a, a big shift towards uh, electronic drivetrain, which actually is in many cases a really good opportunity because it's a lot simpler mechanism. But it also means everything is, is based on electronics and we have to make sure that it's completely secured and completely um, well designed. This is still an area that's rapidly evolving. Every car company, every OEM is working to solve this problem. We think it's going to require great collaboration, great industry standards to solve this in a way that's scalable. And I think it's going to be great opportunities ahead. And this also links back to machine learning, because if you look at autonomous driving, uh, it's not just it's not a one layer solution. Actually, it's a much more complicated solution because you have to start with sensing. So sensing can be things like, you know, radar or, uh, you know, 
ultrasonic sensors and so on, visual systems. But it's not sufficient to just have a sensor that you say something is out there. Then you have to take it to the next level, which is perception, is to say what is out there. It's a little bit like the camera example I gave you before. It's like, this is a pedestrian, this is another car, this is a street sign. So going from the information to data, or going from data to information, where the much higher level of learning. And then once you have that information, say, okay, what do I do? Because it's going to be a complicated decision where I've got a pedestrian here, I've got a car here, which way do I go? You have to have that higher level of understanding and then the electronically uh, controllable systems that then put that into place and actuate that. So it's actually a multi-layer, quite a complicated solution, and we're going to have to solve all of those problems. And uh, our ARM today is deployed in many of these subsystems. We're working hard to get deployed in more. One of the critical things in this market is, uh, is, is, dry, is ensuring safety critical systems. Today, Many subsystems are what's called ASILB, which is a sort of the middle tier of security for uh, safety certification. But many of these systems are now moving towards the requirement for ASILD, which is a much higher level redundant uh, capability and the related certification standards that ensure that. This is something that we've done in collaboration with Synopsys, where a lot of Synopsys tools are capable and supportive of, of helping us to get safety certification. ARM is also taking safety certification so that our products have the raw materials needed so an end designer can put it together and get the ultimate safety uh, certification needed to serve these mission critical and life critical applications. So it's a very exciting time. And if you look at these, um, this is a, a bit more technical uh, drawing of, of how a car works. The sensing is at the bottom. You have all these different sensors that come with it, both within the car and outside the car. And then you're seeing these more complicated modules where now you have a sensor coupled with a lot more processing. It's a bit like, uh, we talked about edge compute earlier. In a way, this is a lot more like edge compute. You really need the processing closest to the sensor because you don't want to send all the data to the, the main brain of the, of the self-driving car. You want to say, oh, everything's fine. We're on the road, we're on the road. Okay, now there's an obstacle. Now you pass up information about the obstacle. But a lot of that first level of sensing has happened at the camera module or at the radar module, the LiDAR module. And then you go in with much higher level information to the controller that's doing the, the deeper thinking about what to do. So these, all of these different modules are going to be opportunities for us as an industry and uh, challenges we have to face. And figuring out how to achieve that interoperability is going to be critical. Which brings us to a perfect segue of talking about ecosystem. You know that ARM is, uh, cares very much about a partnership model. And ARM has developed, of course, our network of partner licensees. There's over 300 of those uh, over time. But we also have over 1,200 partners that work alongside ARM, providing software, debug, middleware, design services, uh, electronic design automation and indeed software training and so on. The, literally to the point where you can't fit the logos on the chart, it's like 1,200 partners. And Synopsys is a key partner in that ecosystem for sure and has been for over 20 years. I think we're up to nearly 25 years. And in fact, this, this is a cool chart and I think it's, it's quite a good metaphor because if you've ever seen these incredible boats that go like 150 you know, miles an hour on the water, what you realize is that they're on the bleeding edge of what is technically possible and it is very easy for them to crash. They crash all the time, right? And we're trying to solve an incredibly complicated problem together, you and us. And having solutions that work together with precision, speed, accuracy is going to be crucial. And you, you know that you're in a competitive landscape where your competitors are trying to beat you to market. They're trying to deliver better quality of results than you are. They're trying to reduce their silicon spins to reduce their margins and be more competitive. So we have to work together. We have to help you achieve optimized implementations that achieve the best quality of results possible. We want to reduce your silicon spins. We want to help you get the fast turnaround time that reduces your cost uh, and helps you deliver the highest value. And then when you add on the fact that more and more of these systems require uh, safety, security, uh, safety certification, there's the levels of complexity that didn't exist before. And that doesn't even begin to talk about more complicated packaging and more complicated systems that are, that are becoming more and more prevalent, at, at, certainly at the high end. So ARM has been collaborating with Synopsys for more than 25 years, and it, you, could, you could have headlines all day long. This collaboration spans a wide range of IP from our CPU to our interconnect to physical IP to our GPUs. We've done a wide range of collaborations with Synopsys for many years on this. 
It extends into our physical IP. We've been delivering an optimization solution called POP, which helps uh, our licensees take their designs to the best possible uh, speed and power and area implementations. And we've been collaborating with Synopsys for a long time. The same goes with verification and system IP and so on. And the last, uh, the last headline, and, and what I'll dig into a little bit, is one of our most recent collaborations. And it's an example, but it's the latest example of a, uh, an impressive history that spans all the way back to the ARM7 processor. So this, I mean, ARM7 is a processor that was in the, you know, a Nokia phone. If you, your very first cell phone you think back to and reminisce about how great it was, ARM and Synopsys were collaborating back then to deliver the solution. But the latest example is our most cutting edge IP. This was an a, a announcement from last year, 2017, with our, our latest Cortex A75. It's our high performance, highest performance multi-core processor coupled with our Cortex A55, which is our multi-core energy efficient processor that works closely in conjunction with it to have high performance and energy efficiency working side by side, coupled with our Mali G72, our latest GPU, very high performance energy efficient GPU, implemented on our physical IP, that's from the ARM side, and Synopsys has brought all of their latest technologies to bear to this collaboration. Des uh, the Design Compiler Graphical, IC Compiler 2, prime time, a whole suite of verification, which I'll talk about in a, middle, in a minute, emulation, models, and so on. And we've, we've worked on this so early because we want to have this collaboration, this foundation of IP ready to go even before we launch the product. So we're working with the very earliest customers so that this has been proven out in the very earliest days so that at the same time we launch the product, we're able to announce this collaboration so that the moment you begin your design, it's ready to go day one. It's not like we launched the product and then we'll get back to you six months later with the solution that works. We're launching this simultaneously because we know that's what it's going to take to get you to the fast time to market you need. And I'm pleased to say that last month we extended this collaboration to our latest generation uh, of processors and continued to uh, extend this uh, for years to come. And this is being used in practice. This isn't a theoretical result. It's being used in practice. This is uh, an announcement from TechCon last year from High Silicon, which is using, uh, this was the previous generation. This was A73, A73 and A53, the previous generation of IP, coupled with a, uh, a Mali GPU as well. This is a production design achieved in 10 nanometer <laughs> using the results of this collaboration. Uh, and this kind of chip, as you know, is incredibly complicated. It's incredibly tough to do at all. It's also incredibly tough to get over two gigahertz of speed, as well as great optimization, great power management, and so on. And they not only achieved their PPA targets, taped out in 10 nanometer, um, and they taped out on time. The results of this, they achieved over two gigahertz. They were able to optimize and get what they think was a really uh, exceptional megahertz per milliwatt, which is so important, and that's a, a complex task. And what they also found was that by working in collaboration with the methodology we talked about and using a wide range of tools from Synopsys, they were able to get tight timing convergence, reach their, their goals very quickly, uh, and get the, get the time to market they needed. And in a complex SOC like that, that's a, that's a real achievement. Because that's what we're seeing across all of these markets is even um, markets from the high end all the way to lower end are finding multi-core design as a normal practice. Our, we're, we have a range of solutions from the very high end. Now we're doing server-based solutions based on ARM. Our partners are, are using server-based solutions on ARM to mid-range performance in everyday smartphones all the way down to power-optimized designs that are more deeply embedded uh, or in other applications. So all markets are seeing the need to have a multi-core, power management, which is really complicated. You can't just, you, you can't do power management unless you're being really deliberate about it. And bringing heterogeneous compute into a platform requires a great methodology. Unless we think that so hardware is the only problem, actually the complexity is go growing in many different areas. The costs at the leading edge are projected to be over hundreds of millions of dollars. And not every market can sustain that kind of that kind of cost profile. It's probably only gonna make sense for markets that are gonna ship in high volume. So the best thing we can do is try to keep those costs in check because the better we can keep those costs in check, the more places we can deploy advanced technology. And one of the things you're seeing is this kind of pink bar, kind of gray pink bar, is the software costs can easily be more than half of the costs of leading edge designs. 
And there's a number of things we can do to tackle that cost. One is work with proven IP foundations, such as from us. Work with proven IP foundations from complementing partners like Synopsys that has uh, interface IP and a number of other important blocks that are critical for these systems. Use existing software stacks instead of starting from scratch because it's easy to say that you can start from scratch and get a better result because everything's open source. But the reality is the cost of getting that done and the cost of verifying that is massive. And then using uh, proven methodology and proven design tools to get the, that proven out and get that tested can make a huge difference in the cost and scalability of design. And so uh, Ed Sperling, fantastic. If you know Ed, he's a great guy and he really looks at these issues. He says uh, that driving these things down and is providing cost savings is critical, critically linked to using reusable IP that's been proven by others and we can get economies of scale. Here's another example. These are two different examples of how customers are addressing this complexity and also addressing the growing cost, uh, growing complexity of verification. This is an example from Konica Minolta and they're using the, what Synopsys I think is a great uh, name, calls their verification continuum. Starting with, um, from, from prototyping to emulation to simulation, they're using, they're using the, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead here. They're using the ability to do a hybrid approach because you want to be able to do deep simulation on the one hand and make sure the details are working uh, uh, in simulation, but you also want to get to the point where you're running more and more cycles and you can prototype much more in advance. As a matter of fact, the second example from Socianext, they talked about how they really focused on a hybrid approach to do verification of some blocks in, in simulation, some blocks in, in emulation using Synopsys' HAPS prototyping tool, and they were able to do a significant amount of their software development before tape out. That allowed them to de-risk their tape out because they were more confident that their tape out was going to work, more confident that it solved the software's problems. So often the chip comes back and you realize, well, the chip works, except there's this software thing we didn't know about and it causes you a real performance problem. So they were able to, to detect this, uh, to debug these problems before tape out and that's so important. And as a matter of fact, it's not just end customers that are using this methodology because ARM internally is using the same methodology as well. We're increasing the verification of our chips, of our designs and our test chips before they get to licensees to the point where we're using EXA cycles, like, you know, you're like megabytes, gigabytes. EXA is 10 to the 18. It's a number that's so big that we don't even usually talk about it in normal conversation. We need to get to that level of cycles of learning to be sure that we're getting all the corner cases. And so we've done a lot of collaboration with Synopsys on prototyping and emulation. They're, uh, they're, what's cool about prototyping and, and emulation is you can get a lot better visibility in the design than you can with a finished chip. A finished chip might run a little faster, but it's a lot harder to find the problems. It's a lot harder to dig into the, the, the issues. And so by using a range of solutions from simulation to emulation to prototyping, it really provides an incredible benefit. This is, there's some examples here, which I don't have talk, time to talk about today from Snug last year. And you can search in these on the Snug archive that talk about how uh, ARM uh, has used this solution and how other partners are using this as well. In fact, ARM has talked about uh, an initiative we, we call Shift Left. And Shift Left is really an initiative where we're trying to do massively more cycles earlier and deeper. And by doing that, we get the bugs out of the design on our side quicker, helps us, but it also means that the IP that gets to our licensees is more verified earlier on in the process. And this is uh, a benefit of using these multiple layers of abstraction and having a, this uh, verification continuum from Synopsys where you can, you can have a range of solutions and debug problems at the right layer of abstraction where you have things that can run incredibly fast and many, many, many cycles because some problems you have to run that many cycles to solve the problem. And other things you have to run in a lot more detail to see the fine grain, uh, the fine grain issues. You have to have all of those solutions to get a good result. And this is a cool chart. It's a little hard to read, but let me explain this to you. These are two different projects from ARM and these are succeeding ARM generations. So generation one, think of that as the three processors ago. We did a lot of methodology one way. If you look at generation two, we begin to use a lot more FPGA emulation, and then the third generation and a lot more after that. And so we were able to find a lot more problems in emulation using FPGA well before design, well before tape out. And the result for you is more reliable earlier on. 
So we've covered a broad range today, and I hope I've got, given you some, um, some things to think about and some interest, some uh, information about some of the trends that's coming in the market. We see four key trends. First, big shift in the way compute is happening, especially compute moving to the edge. And this is particularly going to impact and benefit from the transition to 5G, which is coming up. The second is machine learning and artificial intelligence, which we think is going to affect every market in ways we can't possibly conceive of today and provide a lot of benefits uh, and benefits and opportunities for us. And third, we talked about safety and security, particularly for IoT and then more broadly for automotive, where these solutions are going to provide us opportunities for incredibly new applications, new sensors, new, new data, but we have to provide the right foundations if we expect them to be safe and scalable into the future. So ARM has been investing and uh, growing and, and trying to deliver the best leading solutions. We've, we Hopefully we've shared some of those with you today. In the same way Synopsys has been leading and growing and investing on their side. And that collaboration with ARM and Synopsys together has been a, a great collaboration for 20, nearly 25 years now to reduce risk, improve your quality of results in your time to market. I encourage you to enjoy uh, today's program where technical experts will tell you a lot about these uh, issues in much more detail. And we really appreciate you coming in here from us today. Thanks so much.